Hi, this is Billie Jean King. I'm Mats Villander. This is Mary Carrillo. This is Pam Schreiber. This is Yannick Noah, and you're listening to The Tennis Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Tennis Podcast live from Wimbledon on day 11 of the Championships and barring a brief but very dramatic derailment, uh, we are here, plan A, dry weather position, I'm here, Matt's here, Hello. David's here. Bit soggy. We are very much the ons de beur of the podcast world today, surviving a derailment, still going. Yes! Um, and we three are here, and we also have a very special guest with us today, a five-time Wimbledon doubles champion, three-time Wimbledon single semi-finalist. It is a very warm welcome to Pam Shriver. Thanks for having me. What Woo. a fun semi-final day it was, and the first championship decided. Awesome! Yes, Pam, you've been watching the mixed doubles final for us. We'll come to that in due course. You're our expert on that. We we were tracking the live scores very closely, having <laughs> having published far and wide that we'd be coming on air after match point at the mixed doubles final. But you'll be our expert on that. But I think I think we have to start with Ons Jabeur, don't we? I think that just, would be just fair. To, just to keep the good vibes going because she is the ultimate good vibe, isn't she? And she's into a back to back. Wimbledon final, having beaten Arena Sabalenka 6-7, 6-4, 6-3. Her second consecutive come from behind improbable victory. She said, the crowd made me win that match. Wow. That that says a lot. And, And it's believable to me. I don't know about you, but sometimes players say these sort of things and I think, yeah, that's a nice thing to say, to get a big cheer and a round of applause. But with her... I believe this stuff. I watched. Um, I, I finally watched the Netflix episode from Wimbledon a year ago last night in preparation for for the coverage today. Always on the ball with the old. Uh, Takes me a while. We started the West Wing like this year. <laughs> so I'll tell you, you, on it. you wait until 2032 <laughs> when I get into Taylor Swift. Um, but seriously, I I was a believer after watching the Netflix documentary. I mean, I was kind of a believer anyway because of what she did against Rebecca and what she's been doing against Andrescu and then um, Kvitova and then Rebecca but just it's it's the conviction it's the belief that she has it in her that she just made an error last year and that this is on and it is on it on. is <laughs> it is I just love how Hans has come out of that difficult half with her draw and you can almost see and feel her mental toughness come through. You can see it in her face. You can see she's doing some mindset visualization exercises right in the middle of a huge match. And it's been apparent in all these big wins. Pam, when did you become an ONS believer? David, it was last night. <laughs> <laughs> I think when I called her match a few years ago here when she made the quarters for the first time and I saw her go to the back of the fence underneath the royal box under the windscreen and throw up and oh, still recover yeah. to yeah. win that Against match. Magarusa. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that was pretty impressive to have that kind of... And, and I feel like she's grown in her ability to de- deal with anxiety and she doesn't do that anymore. I mean, maybe she does, but I think some of the mindsets helped her deal with the anxiety. It's been great. Matt, can you pinpoint the timeline of becoming an ONS believer? You know, I think I probably became an ONS believer right before she lost in the first round of Roland Garros last year. (laughs) At her at that tournament last year, and it was really shocking to me that she ended up losing in the first round there. You know, she'd she'd been brilliant on the clay going into that event. Um, And then honestly, The run here last year to bounce back from that, I felt really made me a a believer. And then after the the heartbreak of not closing that Wimbledon final to then reach the US Open final, these were just these were just really good signs, I think. But honestly, I I'm not sure I was an Onshabur believer at this tournament. I mean Pam mentioned mentioned the draw she's had. I mean, we said on, on our draw show, you do not want to be in the bottom half of this draw. But whoever comes through it is going to be so hardened and so toughened. And I just probably expected it to be Sabalenka or 
Rabatkina and Ons Jabur has beaten both of them from a set down and her resilience, her defiance in those in those two matches and her tennis. I mean, how can you not be an Ons Jabur believer now? Well, everyone inside Centre Court was today, weren't they? I mean, they they are so with her. Well, as I said, she said the crowd made me win that match and I, I take her at her word on that. I'm not sure she would have won without them today. It was a, it was the roof was on for both semi-finals today and I felt like that had a really big effect as we said earlier in the tournament with the roof being on it amplifies things both ways if things are flat it feels extra flat that echoey effect just kind of really leaves you feeling a bit hollow if it's atmospheric if it's vibesy that is amplified and I felt like with the first semi-final and, and kind of the first half of the second semi-final it flattened things out a bit and then suddenly it caught fire and Ons just took it and ran with it and used it as fuel and it was utterly electrifying. You know, there was a moment when after the first set and Jabir had lost it on that tie break where Catherine said to me, do you have the same feeling you had yesterday about, or two days ago about when she defeated Rebecca from a, a set down? And I, I said, honestly, no, I, I still think it could happen, but I don't have that sense of conviction about it. And the reason was because in the tie break, she hit a forehand, mm. which she thought she'd made to go up, I think, 5-4 in the tie break, and which was a really m a moment of celebration for her because it's a big shot to have had to make. She thinks she's made it, she's celebrated it, and then it got overruled by Hawkeye and she lost the set. And I'm thinking, I mean, you you would have had situations like that, okay, not with Hawkeye, Pam, but you've had moments where you think you've hit a shot, it's called out, and things change, and you've got to try to regroup. And I just thought, how do you regroup from that but against this woman? That's where, that's where the mindset coach, you could see the two of them speaking, right up until the moment Jabur started to walk out on the court. And that's when you really call on all that training, is when you've had that kind of setback um, and then she's down 2-4 in the second set. And uh, I think at, all, at that point we thought, wow, okay, we got two games away from a switch in the number one ranking. We're going to have Sabalenka in her first Wimbledon final. But now Sabalenka's got to go back and think, wow, I've only won one semifinal, and that was over Lynette at the Australian. Um, this has been a tough back-to-back -back majors in the semis for Ons. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about there with um, Arena Sabalenka. With Arena, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. we... Um, we will get on to it all. Let's stay on the mental stuff with, with Ons Jabeur for a while because she said, again, on the court, she said, old me would have lost that match today. And I I quizzed her on that just now in the press conference. Well, it feels like just now. It was actually about an hour ago because <laughs> the mixed doubles final uh, went on rather a long time. But um, I said, how old are we talking? Are we talking about you a year ago here at Wimbledon? Would you have lost that match? Or are we talking about you sort of way back in the day and she said more recently than than 12 months ago she said me of six months ago would probably have lost that match and she said today was all about patience and she said injury has taught her to be patient the injury obviously the woes that she was suffering at the beginning of this year I mean she, let's remember she pulled out of Madrid two months ago with a calf, a calf tear. She pulled out of that tournament where she was defending champion. She came into the French Open, she still reached the quarterfinals, but she told herself after losing that quarterfinal, she had rushed her comeback from injury because it was the French Open. This is the first tournament really where she's been fully fit since those injury struggles. So she said, injury taught me to be patient and it taught her to deal better with things out of your control. And so much about playing a player like Arena Sabalenka is dealing with stuff out of your control. She said, like, for example, the Arena Sabalenka serve. There was an acceptance about her, day, her today that this ain't going to go my way a lot of the time. I just need to make it go my way on the last point of the match. Yeah, and actually, Ans Jabeur's serve was returned less in play from Sabalenka than the other way around. So Jabeur actually held her own with her serve yeah and like halfway through this match Jabur started reading the Sabalenka serve and getting so many returns back into play in that third set I think she was returning 
well over 80 percent of Sabalenka's serves in that final set and that just increased the pressure on Sabalenka you know she's she's normally able to rely on cheap points three points after that serve and, and she wasn't against Jabir because she was getting so many of them back I thought that was a massive switch up halfway through this match that Jabir started reading the Sabalenka serve and yeah just just generally I thought she did hang in there really well because I actually thought she was the better player in the first set I mean it was it was a it was a slightly odd first set I wasn't really that into it and I was I was sort of annoyed at myself that I wasn't that into it because it was on Jabir and it was Arena Sabalenka they're two of my absolute favourite players to watch it was but bitty, it was wasn't bitty. It? there was no mm, rhythm there was a, there was a lot of errors um, and for Jabir not to win that having probably been the better player I felt was a massive moment for Sabalenka to have taken that set and Sabalenka looked looser and freer that, that isn't a round of applause it's for my point for is it no <laughs> <laughs> it's a round of applause for Tim Herman and John McEnroe, but just. But I will take it. Um, it's well, well said, Matt. Yeah. On Thank another you. show. Thank you. Um, Savalinka looked freer suddenly, and she cut down on her unforced errors, and she was she was suddenly playing really, really well. And for Jabir to to flip this match around from that point, I thought was was just so so impressive. Were we seeing French Open semi-final scar tissue on display for Arena Sabalenka today? I think that was on a lot of our minds and, and, and all the other semifinals right. except for the one at the Australian. So I, I, Sabalenka has a lot of work to do to get over the five semifinals she's lost. I've got a question for you, Pam, as a, as a player, something that I, I, would, I would simply not be I've able to know. I've seen you play. You can play. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I find so interesting about Sabalenka is it feels like every match is on her racket. You know, she's got such a big game and that feels like such an advantage normally. You know, she's playing well, she's able to control everything. But in a way, it feels like a, a disadvantage when it starts going wrong. Yeah, no, it's a big responsibility, right? To have that kind of power. Uh, Rebecca has it a little bit too. Right. Kvitova when she plays great on grass. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, she's lost three of her last slam semifinals. She was 4-2 up in the third against uh, Sviantec at the US Open. She was 5-2 up in the third against Mukova just a few weeks ago and 4-2 up in the second today. Winning positions in all of those. And it, it just feels a bit like when things start going wrong, there's no way of, of getting it back on track in that, in that pressure environment of a semi-final. We've seen her do it all year, mm. reverse matches back in her favour, but in the semis, she's, she's still having a bit of trouble. And it, it just feels like it's all on her and it's almost like she needs to just rein it in and kind of let the other player start missing a bit but but she just does all the missing and yeah i think there was real real scar tissue from those from those semi-finals from from sabalenka today jabir got a lot lot better for sure but sabalenka's control just sort of went it, it makes me think of something that Daniela Hantikova once said to me which was that she always found semi-finals so much harder than finals like you're almost there but you still have everything to lose she had scar tissue early on in her career from having a six love two love lead on Anna Ivanovic in an Australian Open semi-final I semi -final. remember that I was courtside for that one and that that obviously stayed with her and the semi-final thing became a bit of bit of a thing in her head but that does make sense to me a bit that it, yeah. the, the semi it's like it's kind of like getting to five in a set is if, if you've got the break getting to five is almost a bit harder than getting to six but I don't know Pam Shriver is not agreeing with me so I feel like I might not be onto something here look at how much of my beer I've already had <laughs> <laughs> we've got There's, some more we had some lovely listeners that what David had already got the beers in several hours ago when we thought the mixed doubles final was finishing in two and then some lovely listeners showed up and brought us Lisa and Jenny supplementary beers mm. so we are plenty beard well up Pam stocked. fill your boots I, I am curious Pam when you say you were courtside for that Hantakova match against Ivanovic can you feel what they're going through as a player who's been there and done it and been courtside is that when it starts to happen can you sense yes it? you can see it on their face right Usually there's a couple of points. I'm trying to think what it was today at 4-2. Um, 
yeah, I think Sabalenka missed a couple. There were a couple of unforced errors that were like, hmm. So, yeah, usually, but I was watching it on the screen today. I wasn't there. There's nothing like seeing it in person, no. and I didn't have that advantage today. Mm. Just, just on um, the match today, the the theme that is developing with Ons I don't know whether you agree with this, is putting away her tricks, putting mm. away her boxer tricks. And if you remember a couple, two or three years ago when we were talking about what Ash Barty was doing with her game, and I would say, why isn't Ons doing what Barty does it's not that dissimilar her game but it was all honestly it was a bit indulgent I felt back then it was look at all this stuff I can do and isn't everybody having a great time watching me play yes we are are you winning no are you going to be in a mix in my lifetime no okay I was wrong but the point is she's not doing that anymore and even a year ago she was doing it but now against Rebecca now she played meat and potatoes tennis and went toe to toe and hitting shots and then the the tricks are, are like a decoration mm. or a, or a dis, disruptor and she only brings them out when she's fully confident and when she's got the opponent on the rack yeah you know, i feel like when on plays these power players she can't overplay the drop shot right because there aren't there isn't the opportunity mm. so i think when ons can't like try and make magic too much with the drop shot that's actually a good thing for her i think the most playful moment she had in the semis was when she was disgusted on missing the ball the ball came back and she kicked it right she jumped mm. way in the air and gave it a kick but for the most part you're right she's like a little more just on the court not trying to put on a show mm. trying I to win that, i think that's the game plan she's mm. talking about you know stay in there mentally and because suddenly in the last four games it was like she was rolling downhill mm. and it's on and the problem is Sabalenka's still trying to out hit that. Yeah. And when she's when on Stuber is on, I don't think you can do that. You've you, as you say, you've got to pull it in a bit. And Pam, I heard you on the ESPN coverage talking about how she's got these compact, tight strokes that actually cope really well with power. Yeah, hundred percent. You could see that. I mean, when you see wh what little take back she has, mm. that's such an advantage against these power players. And of course, helps on grass. And I think it's hard to read. Of course, it, you know, when we speed ahead to the final, it's going to be a totally different pace of play. Right. Gonna, it's just a nightmare. But, you know, Jabir is going to feel like this is, this is now her time. Yeah, we will talk about the final. We, um, I was going to make a point there about Ons Jabir, but I, I think... I think it has been superseded, should we say? It was. It wasn't a point that was going to get applauded by uh, by Tim Hemman. <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, do you think Sabalenka was at all weighed down by the prospect of being able to reach number one today? She was asked about it in the press conference. Was that present in your mind? And she didn't say no. She kind of said the things that you say about, well, you know, it's not. That's the thing that comes if you get the right results and you can't be focused on ranking she, and I'll get it if I, I'm confident that I will get it at some point this year, but it it wasn't a no. <laughs> she basically said she's into the race because she <laughs> because she cares most about number number one at the end of the year. She feels like, you know, year end number one is is maybe more significant. But yeah, there was there was there were two big things on the line for Sabalenka, but honestly Given we've seen this from Sabalenka before in semi-finals, it didn't necessarily, to me, feel like a, a number one thing. It felt like a like a semi-final thing. You know, we've we've seen this exact Sabalenka in the past. I I didn't sense that it was necessarily an an extra element to this match, but maybe it's impossible to separate. Right, the pressure you feel to get your first Wimbledon final versus the pressure you feel to get to number one throw them all together it's mm. like where does one end and the other start it's all just mixed up with pressure and I think that did show on her face she looked under a ton of stress as she was trying to get closer to closing it out did not look as comfortable as she did against keys on one or the other times during the tournament I keep thinking about that stat that flashed up during the ESPN coverage of the US Open last year about how amazing Sabalenka's record was after losing the first set which is a fantastic stat to have in your locker but I guess the flip side of that is she's kind of better after losing the first set than she is after winning the first set which is 
what we saw today. I don't I'm know. I'm still what... surprised though. You know, I suppose that the biggest point that I take from it is that she does have this problem when she's closing in. Would you call it a problem now? I would. Do you think yeah. Arena Sabalenka I mean, if... has a closing problem? At, the, at yeah. the biggest matches, you know, that's twice in... They were both semi-finals, right? I mean, and you mentioned another one against Fiontech, which I must admit I'd forgotten that one. Yeah, you were but top last year. The, the Mukova one was... You could argue, I suppose, oh, well, that's, you know, she doesn't usually do that. That's maybe a one-off. Now that she's had this happen to her as well, I do think that's a problem. And yet she was so great in pressure moments in the Australian Open final mm. like it, it, it's not a it's not a black and white thing there is some some grey and some shade but, but maybe that was because she had got over what was the hurdle in her own mind yeah. which was the semi-final thing yeah also possibly. they're equal to each other in, in being like the power player right. almost right yeah. she's playing Rybakina who is just crushing the ball it's all on like response reflex there's mm. no time to kind of mm. think and I don't these know these are different different matchups yeah right yeah yeah I always remember my figure skating coach saying to me you're rubbish when you have to think about things turn your brain <laughs> off she would say ha- haven't figured it Did out do you have any of those Pam <laughs> do, I mean like closing in on a I mean obviously you here, and Martina I had the problem here two of my my first two losses I had match points up Sue Barker on center court my first year and the second year, I had match point on Billie Jean King on court two, back-to-back year. I never recovered from that. Never. How, at what stage wow. of your career was that? Early, Early. My first two Wimbledon. So I was scarred from the beginning. So it does, st- in my mind, especially at the majors, it does stick with you. Now, we didn't have this whole mindset coach thing because I would have, I should have employed one right then. When I lost to Billie Jean the second time, I should have, like, that's it. Do you think that's a big thing for Anstra Bird that she's got M- M- Melanie Meyer? Phenomenal. Like, I think literally in, in trying to help Donna in the last eight or nine months, that was really one of the things I wanted her to do right away was hire a mindset coach. And she's kind of getting there, but it <laughs> hasn't responded as quickly. Um, but I, to me, it's so obvious. And it's obvious in other sports as well. When you Like, like the U.S. Open golf champion, Wyndham Clark. Hired somebody at the end of last year. Oh, wow. He wins the U.S. Open. It's like therapy, isn't it? It's not going to do any harm. Why wouldn't you give it a go? The more tools you have, especially the most important muscle, which is, look, by the time you get to this level, it's clear. It's between the ears. It's how you handle the moments. So, And there's a lot of things you can do to help. Seeing as you've mentioned Donna, I have to ask. I don't know if you you spoke totally to, depressed on <laughs> on the fact that who she lost to in the well, round. Right. That's my question. Does it make it better losing to an eventual finalist, or Both. does it make it worse? You think that could have been me? I, I I said to her today. I said, okay, I'm about to do a studio hit. Tell me what makes Vondrosova, Vondrosova so tough. And she basically swore at me <laughs> asking the <laughs> <a> question. <laughs> so. I mean, I'm happy she's still, like, feeling the pain of it. But to me, I always would prefer to lose to whoever won the tournament. Yeah, but I think when right. it's around a round of 32, after you've had the great win as you did over Sloan, and you go to court 15 and you can't produce the same thing, and she, Donna, anyone in the, that half of the draw, there's probably 12 people that thought it could be them, it, that they could be Vondrosova. Mm. And Donna was one of the 12. How long do you... I don't know a sort of more delicate way to phrase this. How long do you want it to hurt for for Donna? Like, where's the bar- where's the balance between you know, hurting means you care, but yeah. also don't let it cripple you. Well, now that the player you lost to is going to be in the final, it's probably not going to stop hurting until Sunday, Sunday or Monday, and that's okay. After you'd watched that match with Donna and Vondrosheva, did you sense that Vondrosheva was in sort of final reaching form it it occurred to me that it was going to take somebody to play really well to beat her that she was in one of those tricky two-week modes like she was when she got the finals of the Roland Garros finals of Olympic Games look tough where do you go she's like really not easy to pick on a side the backhand's more tricky with slice and drop shots. The forehand's got that typical lefty. Not you know, really many like her, are they? No. But yet has some of the, just that tricky leftiness. She hit a swinger out wide today on a, actually one of the 
big points. It was whew, impressive. Yeah, well, Anja <laughs> is going to be the orthodox player in this final, <laughs> isn't she? Wow. Well, I think, I think it's going to be really interesting whether Jabir gets drawn in to going back a little bit to mm. the box of tricks and playing the drop shots and the slice, or whether she actually decides it's been working really well for me to play a bit more of a power game and a bit, you know, just just keep it a little bit simpler, I suppose, a little bit, a little bit less fancy. But I don't know. It's I could feel like she might get sucked in to to the those sorts of rallies that von Drosheva wants. It's going to be fascinating. David, you commentated on von Drosheva's six three six three win over Alina Svitolina. Quite one sided. Uh, look, it could have been horrifically one-sided because it was 6-3, 4 love, 40 love, mm. right? So she's got three game points for a 5 love lead. And it was frankly awkward because you've got a whole centre court crowd that has come out to watch this match and they've all bought into the Alina Svitolina story. They've all seen it on TV. She's been amazing, hasn't she? She's been a joy to watch, Alina Svitolina. Frankly... Von Drosova was really the opponent in their mind, I think the majority today, and yet she's wiping the floor with Svitolina, playing brilliant tennis, just carving her up, using the leftiness, using the touch. Svitolina completely proving Charlie Eccleshare on this show right last night. What a cool that was. About how flat she might end up being. She was, she was flat, she couldn't find a game, she couldn't deal with what was coming her way, she couldn't do all the things she'd done to get her there, and I mean, it was just awkward. It was uncomfortable, and I, I mean, good good luck to Vondrosa. And then suddenly, it changed, mm. changed. And I, I think mostly that was Vondrosa just getting really tight. Well, it was too easy, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> At three love, she uh, Vondrosa won that game, but there were unforced yeah. errors started to creep in there. And then, boy, oh boy, did it get tight. Yeah, and and then you you from my vantage point in the commentary box, just towards the end of that four love forty love game that. Svitolina held, you suddenly saw her body language change. She got energised. She got into kind of, I can tell you're nervous. Okay, I'm not going to miss a ball. You're going to have to deal with me for the next 10 minutes if you want to win this match. And she holds. And then she breaks. And then she holds again. And then suddenly it's 4-3. And it's Von Drosova serving. And she can't make a serve. She's, she's double faulting all over the place. And really, at that point, I thought she could completely com- collapse. Um, and uh, Marion Bartley was sitting next to us, and she reminded us of the Sabina Lezicki final that she played in, that she was leading, I think, 6-4, 5-1. And then suddenly Lezicki got back to 5-4. And I remember commentating on that too from the same chair. And you just get this feeling of this runaway train that this player can't control anymore and it was right in the balance it was right in the balance at 4-3 uh, or 5-4 and then and then fair play to Von Drosova. she just steadied herself Svitolina missed a couple and she got over the line of course the biggest moment with a Czech player on centre court to have a lead slip was Novotna Graf in the yeah. final I mean that, that we'll never see anything like that but I actually thought about Novotna today when things started to get super tight mm. but then Svitolina kind of like it Four three kind of she gave a few things a back. Yeah. yeah, she missed a couple. Yeah, you know. that was it. It was I was so ready for this match to become really exciting because Fitalina had the crowd behind her. She had the momentum, and I was I, doing my best. <laughs> David was was, <laughs> was. I was listening. It was sensational. Giving it all in commentary, and as soon as Fitalina got it back on serve, she then went away again, and and the sort of flatness returned. Um, but I. I I do think it's interesting because, you know, we've talked about how Ons Jabeur has played a lot of power players in this tournament. Svitolina had played a lot of flat hitters as well. You know, she had played Venus, she'd played mm. Mertens. Um, Kennen. Kennen, Azarenka. She hadn't seen a ball like Von Drosheva's. You know, obviously, Igor Svontek, that was maybe a bit different. She can hit with a lot of spin as well, but it's not like Von Drosheva. And I think she was totally out of her rhythm you know Svitolina wants rhythm and she didn't have any of that today and that that sort of contributed I think as well to her not playing so well as as the general pressure and flatness and Ons Jabeur is going to have to deal with that as well because she's not played anyone like Von Drosheva and I think that's such a big 
factor going into the final? She was absolutely devastated, Alina Svitolina, mm. after that loss. She was perfectly polite in her press conference, but there were uh, a lot of questions sort of asking her to talk about the crowd and how wonderful they've been for her this tournament and go into all of the the geopolitics of it all, which she usually is fantastic with and really expends a lot of energy on. And today she just she just couldn't. Every time she was asked one of those questions, she was sort of like, well, yeah, obviously, but I'm too gutted to think like that right now. I just can't. She just kept on falling back That's into that. Enough. Just, I'm too gutted. Um, she teared up a little bit in the press conference, but then composed herself fantastically well. And we've heard her in previous press conferences this tournament talk about one of the things that's been motivating her and inspiring her is the feeling of how few opportunities she might have left to do this. Um, I, I don't think she knows how long she's going to play on the tour for, but I don't know. Does anyone feel ready for the Will Svitolina get into this position more and potentially win one of these conversations? Well, I'm not sure about that, but I do want to celebrate. I was working in Charleston when she played her first tournament back and lost her first round and looked like like most people coming back from maternity leave, a little rusty at the beginning. And when you think what she's done the last two majors, really incredible, especially the background of what's going on in her homeland, having had a baby, what, eight, nine months ago. It's one of the great comebacks. I mean, I know we've seen quite a few with Kleisters in 09 after maternity leave, what Serena did getting to four major finals. But to, Svino, to me, if Svitolina plays the way she's played here with a bigger forehand and going, being more risk-taking, I don't know if she'll ever win a major, but I, I, can, I can see her getting to the top ten. I just hope she keeps playing this kind of tennis because it's a thrill. It's such a great addition to the tour, Svitolina playing mm. like this with those open shoulders. I kind of think she will because I don't really feel like she's got much to lose now. She's already made 20 million in prize money. She's already had a great career. She doesn't need to defend it. She needs to attack it. Mm. She needs to attack the rest of her career now. And I think she will probably be sufficiently unshackled now and seen the benefits of it to go for it. It may not, it may not get where she wants to go ultimately, but I, I think the approach will be the right one. And I like her coach. I like what Slutter is getting her to do. I mean, sometimes that voice at the right time of your career can make a huge difference. Yeah, we're Raymond fans. Oh, he's a, show, he's a top bloke. Um, Marquette von Drusheva, cat news... Obviously, oh, yeah. about 50% of her post-match pre-final press conference was cat-related. <laughs> People have really latched onto this cat. Do you remember that Wimbledon where Joe Conta had started doing baking? I remember. On her mm. Instagram, yeah. it was a thing. And every press conference, there were numerous baking-related questions baking puns from tabloid <laughs> journalists. Joe, do you think you can cook up a storm on centre tomorrow? Oh can you rise um, to the <laughs> I feel like Frankie the cat is uh, the Joe Conta baking oven of 2023. Um, a cat sitter has been contacted, <laughs> services have been engaged and Marquette von Drosheva's husband will be able to come to town for the final because the cat sitter is looking after Frankie. Phew. You can all breathe a sigh of relief. Thank you. Frankie is looked after, but her husband will be able to be here. And you have a reason if she doesn't win, blame it on the husband. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because she's done all this winning without him. Her sister's coming into town. Um, yeah, she talked, uh, another thing she talked about in her press conference after the win today was her closeness with the other Czech players and Simon told us on the pod the other night that she's the Czech number seven <laughs> yeah not anymore but she was well, yeah. yeah the Czech that number seven astonishing. I mean crazy. she's had horrible injury problems hasn't she wrist injury wasn't it that's uh, yeah this time her. last year she was her wrist was still in a cast and she but she was just about to get it removed ahead of her wedding hmm. she wanted the cast off before the and wedding by the way do you think she needs her wrists the way she plays <laughs> Right. Two amazing. surgeries yeah, last year. To have that and have all this feel. And, and you think of the litany of players that have had 
wrist as soon as you as soon as I hear wrist I think dun 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 that's yeah. bad I think of Laura Robson and Juan Martín del Potro and Dominic yeah. Team, who is healthy but can't sort of get the trauma of the wrist injury out of his mind and now Emma Raducanu as well yeah so for her to be in this position less than a year on is extraordinary yeah and there's this incredible thing that she'd only won four matches on grass in her entire career before this Wimbledon wait say that again (laughs) <laughs> Four on grass in her entire career. Are you thinking of Donna right now? Not helping, is it? <laughs> <laughs> She's now on six. One She's of those really is Donna Beckett. Um, <laughs> and and the thing is, like, if you'd said to me at the start of the year that Mukova would reach the Wimbledon final and Von Drosheva would reach the yeah. Roland Garros final, I think, yeah, yeah, okay, that sounds very possible. But for it to be the other way around, I think is is really interesting. But. Sanya Mertz on the BBC coverage was just talking about how, yeah, she didn't have a good record on grass, but it was only a matter of time because actually that game is is pretty suited to it. I think Pam talked about that lefty swinging serve. I think that's a nightmare for players on the grass and the slice and the drop shot and the hands that she's got. Like it all, now it makes sense why that she's playing well on grass. Why are lefties particularly dangerous on this surface, Pam? Well, I feel like lefties learn spins better than righties, and I feel like a grass court takes a spin better than most ladies surfaces. Oh, oh. Yes. rounds will be uh, closing. Is he calling me a lady? Around Fifteen minutes. Please make your way to the exit gates. Make sure you take all your belongings with you. We hope you've enjoyed your day here at Wimbledon, and a pleasant and safe journey home. Thank you. He's oh, even... you missed the thank you. Oh, he's even got the intonation. It's three going more days on now. to mm. go. I've nailed the pause before at Wimbledon. Yes. I need to get the thank you. Can you do the 9:30 a.m. buggy one? It tells everybody to get their buggies. We've, I have nev- not been, never here been here at 9:30. Here at 9:30 I have. <laughs> you're you're going to have to do it. Hang on. Go on, Pam. Over to you, Pam. Would all workers please get ready to leave to take your buggies off the premises? We're about to open the gates, something like that. Who's got, who, where are all these buggies? Buggies, I don't know. <laughs> There's no horse in buggies. <laughs> what, what would we say? Pam, you were saying about lefties. Yeah, just, I believe like in other sports, whether it's golf, they, they learn to shape the ball more. I think they realize that they have a look that right-handers don't get to see very much. They're only like 10% of the opponents. And they know the more baffling their spin is. And I feel like coaches coach lefties pretty doggone well to like lean into their strength here, which is like they, whoever you're playing today doesn't get to see you very often. Mm. So I don't know. They they learn spin more. Von Drosjevid today said she hates playing other lefties. Aha. Oh, really? Yeah. That's very interesting. And I know... I know Greg Rosetsky, famous lefty, fam- <laughs> famous, famous for me anyway. Uh, he hated playing other lefties. It's like, you know, this is my thing. It's like, mm. I don't know, if you've got a thing which you feel sort of defines your personality, yeah, it's, it's someone like else comes. It's like you with other tall people. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if, I meet, if I meet John Isner or Eva Karlovich, or Ra- I don't like it. I, that's my thing. It's a tall right? man thing. My brother's yeah. the same. Mm, d- well, I really don't you're like taller it. than my brother, and that doesn't go down brilliantly. <laughs> oh, I, I, I like your brother because we're, you know, because I'm taller. <laughs> <laughs> um, she, yeah, she talked Von Drosheva about her relationship with the other Czech players. She said she spoke to Barbara Krojcikova before the match today, and she said what good friends she is with Karolina Mukova. They come from the same club in the Czech Republic. <laughs> Gotta love it. We should be talking about that more. Back to back Grand Slam finalists coming from the same club. I mean, I know with sort of Czech women's tennis, we're so just like, well, yeah, all the clubs are producing <laughs> Grand Slam champions every other weekend, aren't they? But let's not sleep on that because that's incredible. Since 1978, the first year Martino won here, first of her nine, then you put Kvitova two, that's 11 plus this, 12. 12 of the 46 championships, so that's 20%. Have been contested and won by eleven of them. Lefty Czech, born in wow. Czech Republic. Wow. All lefties. That's a great stats. Are they, so were they at the? We might none of us be qualified to answer this, but I do wonder if they're sort of 
encouraging young players to be lefty in the Czech Republic? I don't know about or are that. They but just selecting you do the lefties. That? I, I, well, Nadal's a righty. Could you? See, yeah, of course. Selectively make yourself a lefty like Nadal did. I do think the parents of all of today's Czech players were greatly influenced by Martina Navratilova. Mm. Mm. It's going to be a great final, isn't it? I, think I really anyway. hope so. I think it's going to be an absolute do you? beauty. I really do. I think you're going to see so much guile. And something I said on the pod the other day, but I was really noticeable today, I'm so pleased that Vondrosheva has got a moment again. You know, because her two big moments before were really lost. You know, Roland Garros, she hadn't played on the main court before the final. She didn't play well in that final, very understandably, given the circumstances. And it was her first major final. I think she'll be able to bring it and, and play better on uh, on Saturday. And also the Olympics was an Olympics that was behind closed doors. There was no one there. And it's it's kind of no wonder that people don't know that much about Marketa Vondrosheva, even though she's had two fantastic results in her career I feel like now the tennis world and the sort of you know beyond that as well the sporting world is getting to know a bit more about Marketa von Dershva because she's doing it on the big stage in front of people for kind of the first time Mm. here here very well said do you think do you think Donna will watch the final Pam she watched today so if she's going to watch the semi I think she'll watch the final how do you think she felt terrible (laughs) I can't say what she said (laughs) I love it. I love it. And do you think, yeah, good. I yeah, want you fine. to feel terrible. hundred yeah. percent. Fine. But I do hope <laughs> starts it's not train, forever. Maybe starts training again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, do you think actually in a way that it might even steal her for US Open and next yeah. year's big tournaments? Like to really think to think to herself, I want to be that. I need to be that. I'm going to keep going and I'm going to train even harder. Well, she already felt that way. Actually, Donna had a, like a vision that she would be the outsider to get to the finals. She actually felt that. I think that's With why With the vision she saw, saw in our predictions. Oh, in our new I know. We, we she thought you were in the semi. She, she actually saw herself in the final. And it turns out it wasn't her. It was who she lost to in the round of 32. So she wasn't that far off. She also lost to the champion in Australia. Yeah. It's Sabalink. She's becoming a thing. It's got to give you belief, hasn't it? Who should listen to in the French Open? Well, it, to me, the okay. era of women's tennis right now, what are we going to have six straight different first-time Wimbledon winners? Um, it's still the era where a lot of... I know fiontech has been pretty dominant for majors in the last, uh, what, three years, but there's still a lot of opportunities. Mm. I mean, I didn't step into the coaching fray because I had a lot of free time. I actually feel like... There's an opportunity out there yeah. for people to sneak through. We, like we've York? hung out at Pam's house. Not a lot of free time. <laughs> mm. And that was a leisurely day. <laughs> that, that, was, that was Pam taking. That was Pam saying, I've got nothing on today. <laughs> More people visited Pam's house in six hours than have ever visited my house. <laughs> you know on that court you played on, you know what happened about a month ago? Two large snakes fell off the retaining oh. wall onto been, our Matt's court. I've been thinking about, I'm never going back on that court. <laughs> never. <Pam>. Normal. <laughs> <laughs> Can you confirm, by the way, Pam, we've been talking about how Matt loves a low bounce. Yes. Mm. Yes, and I gave him plenty of low bounces, and he liked well, it. Well, it was pouring with rain, wasn't it? That <laughs> yeah, was, the court I mean, was slick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Also, also can, can we confirm, just... I don't know. I don't know why I'm throwing you so many bones here. During, during that hit that you had with Matt, you compared him to Martina? Um, maybe... <laughs> Maybe I did. <laughs> How much you like to move, come forward? I believe was it was my half volley. Oh, yeah, it was the half volley. That's right. That's I right. Yes, I did. Was. Matt's correct and Catherine's correct. There you go, Matt. So it's on, glad it's that's on, on video. Yeah, yeah, it's on YouTube forever <laughs> until new technology comes along. Um, we are going to have a... Cameraman Matthew's laughing because he beats my ass every time we play. <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's like, thinking... if he's Martina, who am I? <laughs> <laughs> he's got to be somebody or something, given he's going to lose a king of the 90s. Oh. <laughs> Not sure he is, though, David. He's got a lead, and there's only three days to go. Mm, there's and plenty I'm, of time. Mm. I'm on Jibber in it. <laughs> uh, we are going to preview the men's single semi finals tomorrow, but first, 
uh, are the news from around the grounds today at Wimbledon. Marcel Grenoz and Horatio Zabayos are through to the men's doubles final. They beat Tim Putz and Kevin Kravitz, 6-4, six, 6-3. Six, they will face Wesley Kulhoff <laughs> and Neil Skubski in that final. They beat Rohan Bapana and Matt Ebden, 7-5, 6-4. I'm so chuffed for, for Neil Skubski. All well, for both of them, actually. We talked about it the other day. They've been so dominant and they've failed at slams, quite frankly, given how good they've been on tour. And I'm chuffed a bit for them to be in this final. I think there are going to be... Uh, I think they're the favourites because they're the top seeds, but there are going to be so many nerves in that final and I wish and them the luck. the men's doubles final, when you think about some of the five setters, it's been unbelievable through the year. I know we're not going to have a five setter, but when you think of the final set been crazy do you remember that one we were yeah. attended last year the three of us didn't we um with Saville and Ebden mm. against Palic and um Mektic Mektic yeah oh that was just incredible absolutely incredible break. yeah uh the women's double semi-finals are at the semi-final stage it's Dolhide and Zhang against uh Hunter and Mertens and Suwe Shea and Bob uh Barbora Stritzova against Marie Buskova and Sara Saribes Tormo. So those matches still to be played. In the wheelchair event, I know, David, you've been covering this closely today. Alfie Hewitt and Gordon Reed are through to the wheelchair doubles fi- final where they'll be going for a fifth title. They meet, beat Martin de la Puente and Gustave Fernandez today, 7-5-6-3 on court one. That's the match you covered for BBC mm. Radio and I could hear the noise from it from from here. It was awesome. Uh, I mean, first of all, great that they're finally given court number one, a show court, to show what they can do. There was a there were thousands there lapping it up. There's so many people that attended that match that I think just will want to return because I mean I think um Hewitt and Reed went up for love in about 16 minutes and you I genuinely thought it's going to be a 50 minute match the way it was going and then quick step by step Fernandez and his and his partner De La Puente they they just they just scrapped their way back into it it was, was it amazing in, in that match one of the players dove for the ball and yeah. ended up Re- flat Re- out Reed, Reed ended up falling forward with his basically his chair on top of him oh and Hewitt came over and just wrenched it off still when the was point incredible. was being played or it was a point over no the point was over but I mean the strength of these the yeah. upper body strength of these blokes is extraordinary and I mean you know there's there's two bounces in the rallies that they're allowed to have but the the reverse forehand they call it rather than hitting a backhand they're hitting these these forehands like that and it's just astonishing the, the 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 racket skills that they have and have honed drop shots and drives and lobs and every it's just such a great watch so i want to start seeing one up one down uh doubles at, at the majors i think it'd be so cool what does that mean you know like one able and and one wheelchair Ooh. i just think that is the next kind of like cool event is that have you seen that yeah before that's the thing that already exists just yep. not I mean, not, it, it's not as much as, you know, in keeping in the same division, but I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm here for that. Uh, so, Alfie Hewitt and Gordon Reed in the men's wheelchair doubles final will take on Takuya Miki, who is 34 years old, and his 17-year-old partner. Pam wants some of my beer. I'll, Hang on. I'll talk through the results while you... <laughs> while you Perfect. That's good. You should have said beer me, Pam. <laughs> 17-year-old Takito Oda in the final. They beat Joaquin Gerard and Ruben Spargaren. I, mm-hmm. We're going to get emails about my pronunciation of that. I thought you did uh, a In good today's job. semi-finals. Uh, Gordon Reed will also face Takito Oda in the singles semi-finals. And Alfie Hewitt will play De La Puente in the singles semi-finals. Uh, in the quad men's doubles, second seeds Heath Davidson and Robert Shaw have reached the final today. They beat Gregory Slade, the Brit, and his American partner David Wagner. Stop distracting me, David. 7662. They will play Sam Schroeder and Niels Vink 
of Neils on Wheels fame in the final. Vink and Schroeder are both on the quad singles as well as is Heath Davidson and the women's wheelchair doubles final is set. That'll be Yui Kamiji and Keiji Montagne and they will play Dida de Krut. Oh no, that wasn't my best. Come on, Catherine. Sorry. Get, Come it, on. get it together. Take this two. is your speciality. Okay. I want to hear a Botic van der Zanschkop after that as well. Come on. Dida de Krut. Sorry. Dida de Krut. One of those. Uh, and Yiska is because it was because I was panicking about the second name that I anyway. And Yiska Griffian. Again, we're gonna get emails. Uh De Groot is also in the single semis. She will face Anik Van Koot, as is Griff Griffin Griffin. Oh so, someone Dutch email us and let us know how I'm supposed to be saying that. Griffin will play Yuikamiji in the wheelchair single semi-finals and the winners of those will meet in the final now the mixed doubles final pam oh dear here's my time You're up. to shine <laughs> if i don't shine i can moment. blame it on the beer <laughs> first off i found the lefty righty both teams were lefty righty combo which is always warm to my heart i thought the women really held their own which is often the case in the mixed finals um just for the interest of getting up here to do the podcast, I was cheering for a straight set. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't alone, Pam. <laughs> but I actually found like the the second set tie break fascinating. Like there were match points, set points, and the joy like of a mixed doubles win um, for Matic and Kitchenok was so joyous and. I thought it was played under great spirit. I thought for the first final, I like that it's Thursday, that the mixed doubles can shine a little bit before like the headlines all get taken away. Right. I thought it was good. Yeah, I'm I'm relieved for them that they won because uh, Pavic and Kitchenok had a match point in the second set tie break and didn't take it. And I was anxious for them all the way through that third set because... Winning from match point up is... And also it's an endorsement for cupping because you saw the back of Kitchenok had all the marks of you know the cupping thing whatever that I, does I, did you listen to the pod where i disclosed that i'd had cupping <laughs> i've listened to every pod you guys have done for over three years but i just don't remember that part i'm not sure i'm not sure it worked for me Pam. you to go and do your homework pam before the next i looked appearance. like i'd been through some sort of great i mean i had been through a great trauma anyway <laughs> the men's singles semi-finals tomorrow uh, you know what they are. It is Yannick Sinner against to Novak Djokovic and then Carlos Alcaraz against Daniel Medvedev. What is going to happen? Well, OK, uh, I did. I hosted an event with an ITF event this morning with Billie Jean King and there was an Italian journalist there and she <laughs> was asked. Name drop. Name drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to take that on the chin. Uh, there was an Italian journalist there who asked Billy Jean King, can you make me feel confident in oh, Yannick wow. Sinner tomorrow? And Billy Jean King told a story about how lovely Yannick Sinner is. <laughs> yes, she did. She it's had, a great story. Yeah, it all made us Yannick Sinner fans, but we have no idea whether that means he's going to win or not. Um, I took that to mean... No, Billy Jean King probably thinks he's not going to win tomorrow, but he's a lovely chap. <laughs> well, how can you pick anyone day. to beat Novak right now? Three out of five sets. Can you make major. a case? No. Well, look, if you go on two sets to love last year, I mean, was Novak similar player last year, right? And Sinner, I think, is better. So, I mean, you can never go into a match believing you can't win. And Darren Cahill will figure out a game plan and give Sinner some belief. What's the game is he, plan? Is he what's as good a coach plan? as we think? Yes. What's the, well, what's I think the game, game plan, plan is, like, look at what Jordan Thompson did. Look at what Hercotch did. Like, he's dropped sets here, right? He hasn't played perfect tennis. So, I mean, I think he's got to go big. He's got to disrupt. You can't let him get into these rally things and be jerked around. You've got to take charge, even if it means, you know, you hit some against the back wall. Does he have the variety and the touch to disrupt forget the touch just blast away power. just oh, power that's good analysis yeah yeah D don't try and be what you're not no. just try and hit through him he hasn't got her catches serve mm. but he's he's got incredible power from the baseline and he needs to just swing for three out of five sets and 
and take it to Djokovic. I mean, look, I think I think Novak Djokovic will ultimately find a way to to weather that. But I I think Yannick Sinner is going to show up tomorrow, and I think I think it might be a similar similar match to last year. Maybe not two sets to love and then Novak coming mm. back, but competitive, competitive for sure. Yeah, look, he's he's absolutely got the game to be competitive for sure. I just think that. The will and the aura of Novak Djokovic. You know what I want to see? I want to see a bunch of blasting hard right down the middle. Like, just take his legs out, just go hard down the middle a couple times, and then take him out wide. Like, just do some things again. Do you think the legs are there to be taken out? We talk so much about how he's age seemingly ageless 36 years of age and yet he never seems to fade physically is that because the question hasn't really been asked yet though do you think the legs being 36 years old are there to be i taken? don't think on a grass court his legs are going to be taken away anyway i think it's got to be taken away by you know the patterns and not giving him you know lots of time to hit just take the time away i don't care if you miss so much just it annoys me when I see how many people, starting with Federer back in the day, when he would get into these long rallies with Djokovic. That was not the way to play him. Anyway, we'll see. Pam Shriver annoyed with Roger annoyed. Federer there. Quite, quite right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't write me. Don't email me. <laughs> They'll email us, Pam. It's going to be okay. great. Um, what, about, what about Medvedev against Alcaraz? I've seen this match in person once this year and it was a beat down for Alcaraz against Medvedev. I don't expect, that was in the Indian Wells final, by the way, I don't expect a beat down tomorrow. I expect the match to look different. Obviously it's different conditions, different everything, but also just because I think Medvedev, given who he is and the type of player he is, will have learned so much yeah. from that. Um, but I do expect Alcaraz to win. I feel similarly. Um, I, I think it could be quite a bit closer actually it could be four sets could even be five do think Alcaraz will win I, I do like the the points you're making about Sinner and I wonder whether Darren Cahill can get into his head to just play the ball and not play that guy down the other end because I think it's that's the hardest thing in the world that's to do become, it? that's becoming more of a problem I think yeah. against Djokovic these guys are getting intimidated by him and he's kind of amping that up with things he's saying but I just think that Darren Cahill may be able to get him sufficiently tunnel vision that he just plays that ball and I think the legs thing is 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 potentially a possible okay. side to side to side to side just play the ball you're 21 he's 36 keep him out there maybe <laughs> maybe says David I was asking about Alcaraz. I was going to say, David's gone but back to Sinner uh, Djokovic. No, but I didn't get Not what I asked, but it was interesting. I would go Alcaraz, and I will go Djokovic, but I think Sinner really has a chance. Really More of a, a chance than Medvedev has yes, against Alcaraz. I, I actually think so. I really? Why. I think it's similar, but I, think, but I would probably agree with Pam. I, I just want to say one thing <laughs> well, on Medvedev. Uh, I was yeah. really, I was think. really impressed how Medvedev changed his return position against yeah. Eubanks. Like... You think about how many players, sometimes we go, oh my God, they're not changing anything. What's going on? Why yeah. is he still all the way back? Mm. And, and, and should he start with that different position against Alcaraz? Because Alcaraz is going to take him off the court, Drop isn't shots. He? And Drop maybe, shot, yeah. Take advantage of that space that he leaves. Why not? Right. Do something, like again, to, to disrupt. Do something a little different early to get Alcaraz a little wondering. <laughs> Alcaraz so exploited that court position totally. in Indian Wells. Yeah. I, I can't believe Medvedev isn't going to learn from that. Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of the best matches I've seen Alcaraz play in that final. It was so tactically astute. Mm. Not only did he take advantage of that space, but he was also really patient in the rallies when he needed to be. It was just an all-round brilliant performance. Um, I still back Alcaraz even on grass against against Medvedev, but fascinated to see what what new stuff Medvedev brings to that so, match. So you bring up Indian Wells. Wasn't that where you guys were exhausted from doing the meet and greets? <laughs> <laughs> Pam's words, not ours. <laughs> Do you come and see us? I, I was a part of their meet and greet. We loved it. Early on. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> fun but tiring. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we've, we've been doing meet and greets here as well, yeah. Pam. Yeah. Anybody who comes and says hello to us, yeah, we, wanna, we, love, we it. love it. Do come. Yes. Do come. <laughs> um, we. <laughs> Pam absolutely dragging us. <laughs> We have our Wimbledon, calm yourself, Matthew. We have our Wimbledon mascot, Erin. Hello, Uh, Erin. Hello, Erin. We have our mascots. David has Maisie. Right, Maisie, another one in the bag. Did you have Jabot in three as well? No, I had straight sets to Van Oh, I had Jabot in three. Nice. To both of you, Matt. It's a disaster, Pam. (laughs) I'm sorry. Pam, can you make my prediction for me tomorrow? We can talk about it. Okay. What did you go for? What did I go for? I think I went for Svitolina in three. Oh, well. I think I'm going to ask Charlie Eccleshare what he thinks is going to happen tomorrow because, honestly, he he knows things. (laughs) He knows things. Um, Matt has Darwin... Sorry, Probably Darwin. Darwin doesn't want to be associated with you at the moment. <laughs> Billy Jean, I don't want to be associated Billy Jean with me. is sponsored by the aforementioned Billy Jean King and Alana Kloss. We have our top folks and executive producers, Jamie, Hannah and Drew. Hello to you all and thank you. And Matt, we have shout outs. We do. We have Joe Duck. In, Joe Duck? In oh, Aberdeen. Duck, Duck, Goose. <laughs> All right, Joe. Like Joe Salisbury. Yes. Joe Dury. Joe Dury. Joe Dury. Joe Comter. Well done. So many tennis Joes. Great. Is it a Joe with an E or with no E? No E. So Joe Conter. Joe Dury. Joe Dury. These yeah. Joes. Joe yeah. Salisbury doesn't count. No. Yeah. Forget I mentioned him. No offence, Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thank We've you, Joe. also got Sylvia Guidara. Sylvia Hanukkah. Yes. See, French Open th- final? Yes, and what winner of the WTA Tour Championships over yes. Navratilova. This is the main reason we got Pam on. <laughs> 80s, 80s tennis. to drag us. We didn't know any Sylvias. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. Sylvia is in Melbourne, oh. one of our favourite places. Absolutely. The barge. The Pam, Pam on the barge. <laughs> we need, we, you know we have on the, on the boat merch. Uh-huh. We're thinking of on the barge with Pam. Perfect. Merch. <laughs> Superb. Mm. Sylvia, thanks for being a friend of the pod. We've been to the barge and we've hanged out with Pam, but we've not hung out with we've Pam on, on the, the barge. barge. With That's Pam. what we want to do next year. There's 2024. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Date. And finally, and I promise you this was totally just how the shout outs fell, not planned. We have Kelsey Turner from Philadelphia and Kelsey says... During my first visit to the US Open as a teenager, I got Pam Shriver's autograph. My dad had to tell me who she was. (laughs) (laughs) That's me, big with dads. (laughs) I was about to make a serious point because because Kelsey says, thanks to the contributions to the pod and her important work on player coach boundaries, it's even more special nearly two decades later. Oh, here's to Kelsey. Thank you. Mm. And to your dad. Mm. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Kelsey. Very much. Thank you to all of our friends of the pod, our shout out friends, our intro friends, all friends of the pod. You are invaluable. You make this show work year round. And we're so grateful to you. Can I say something? That. I just want to say that you guys have become three of my really good friends. I want to thank you for all the support. Well, thank you our pleasure thank Pam. they're you. my buds even though it's i give them a pleasure. hard time like on my second beer like they're my they're my pals yeah. my pod pals yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks Pam. likewise cheers. likewise Pam. Cheers, cheers with cheers with the beer you stole from me yeah. <laughs> no guilt no guilt <laughs> cheers Pam. cheers to all of you watching and listening uh we are very grateful to you for for joining us throughout this live from Wimbledon Journey. If you'd like to subscribe to the newsletter and get King of the 90s updates, oh, I no, I've still got work to do strongly tonight, encourage you to do that. Uh, do hit like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Leave us an Apple podcast review if you're listening to the pod and would like to do that. And tell your friends because word of mouth is important in the old podcast world. And thank you for listening. We will be back tomorrow. There are three more of these to come and two live preview shows ahead of the finals on Saturday and Sunday. So plenty more to come from Wimbledon. We'll see you tomorrow.